everybody. Uh, this week we have with us Deacon Harvey Balser as our facilitator. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to him so he can begin the evening. Deacon Harvey. Yes. Good evening. Thank you very much, Bert. Um, as Bert said, we have um, we're going to arrange it a little bit different. Uh, we would like the volunteers to volunteer ahead of time to read so then we don't have to be searching, searching or waiting for someone to volunteer to read. So we have a total, uh, we need a total of six volunteers. And, um, and then uh, all you're gonna do is, is read. Now, if you have the Ponder book, that's great. We're gonna start on page uh, 30, but actually we're gonna start with the prayer on the front cover. But before that, page 30, we are the fourth Sunday of Advent. And the first reading is from 2 Samuel, chapter 7, verses 1 to 5, 8b to 12, and 14a and 16. So that's the first reading. Uh, let me set the whole theme for you, uh, the, the mood of this. The mood of this uh, entire, all these readings is nothing is impossible for God. That's the whole theme of uh, the fourth Sunday of Advent. We know what God can do if we let him. And that's where we uh, kind of fall down a bit. But we are uplifted all the time. And so with that said, we're going to have some uplifting music to set the mood. I want you to listen closely to these words. You're going to recognize the singer, or in this case, singers, there are two. They will be giving you a message. They will be giving us a message. And the message pertains to all these readings for the fourth Sunday of Advent. Bert? <laughs> Thank you, Bert. I hope that woke us up and set the stage for us. It is Christmas, whether we want to believe that or not. <laughs> so we have to believe. All right. Here's a lady that I chose to be the to set the tone for us. She comes from abject poverty. That was the reason I chose the song. She knows, even to this day, she knows what belief is. She knows what, what wishes are, she hopes. She knows how to pray. She went through a lot and she's trying to portray that to us in her song. Hopefully she did that. Hopefully we think about our belief system, not in silly things, but in real life things like, can we get through this uh, time of trial in, in the world? Can we get through this time of trial perhaps in our own families? Do we believe that God is there and he's listening? And he is listening. We now have the first reading, please. Uh, Kristen, were you going to do that for us? The first reading is from the book of Samuel. When King David was settled in his palace and the Lord had given him rest from his enemies on every side, he said to Nathan the prophet, here I am living in a house of cedar while the ark of God dwells in a tent. Nathan answered the king, go, do whatever you have in mind for the Lord is with you. But that night the Lord spoke to Nathan and said, go tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, should you build me a house to dwell in? It was I who took you from the pasture and from the care of the flock to be commander of my people of Israel. 
I have been with you wherever you went, and I have destroyed all your enemies before you. And I will make you famous like the great ones of the earth. I will fix a place for my people Israel. I will plant them so that they may dwell in their place without further disturbance. Neither shall the wicked continue to afflict them as they did of old since the time I first appointed judges over my people Israel. I will give you rest from all your enemies. The Lord also reveals to you that he will establish a house for you. And when your time comes and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your heir after you, sprung from your loins, and I will make his kingdom firm. I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. Your house and your kingdom shall endure forever before me, your throne shall stand firm forever. Thank you, Kristen. I have been reminded that um, I kind of got excited over the song and forgot the opening prayer. So I just heard the, the words from Samuel. So let's keep them in the back of our mind and let us truly begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The opening prayer can be found in your text on the very front cover or depending on what you have, what, what version you have. But it's in the front. Let the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable before you, Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. And the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you for the reminder. That was my compadre, Deacon Elmer. Yes, he is there. He's a he's the strong, silent type. Okay, with that said, we read the first reading. Hopefully we had a moment to reflect. If you'd like to take more time, let's take more time. But what strikes you? in a word, in a phrase, in whatever, what strikes you from this first reading? Disturbance. Go do whatever you have in mind, for the Lord is with you. I have you. Could we do that one again, please? We had a override here, please. Sorry, uh, I have been with you. Thank you. I will fix a place for my people of Israel. I'll share some in the from the chat. We Please. have uh, the words pasture, flock, father, uh, the word rest. Also, the the number of times the Lord says I. The Lord also reveals to you that he will establish a house for you. Are there any other thoughts, comments?
endure ever. Can you please repeat that? There was an echo, please. Someone typed in the chat, chat uh, endure forever. Endure forever, okay. The thing that struck me, it wasn't so much a, a word as to a situation that King David found himself in with his opening, <clears throat> excuse me, with his opening sentence. King David was settled in his palace. And then he realized, where is my God living? That perplexed him. And he was in conversation with God. Remember, I want to put this out to you before we read it for the second time. I want you to think about this. Here's an idea that David's line or house will be made firm. And over time, this idea developed into a theological understanding of a religious messiah who is not just an anointed king, but is the messiah who will descend from the line of David. That's pretty powerful. Look what's coming. Think about that. May I have the second reader to read this again, please? The first reading by Samuel. When King David was settled in his palace and the Lord had given him rest from his enemies on every side, he said to Nathan the prophet, here I am living in the house of cedar while the ark of God dwells in a tent. Nathan answered the king, go do whatever you have in mind for the Lord is with you. But that night the Lord spoke to Nathan and said, go tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, should you build me a house to dwell in? It was I who took you from the pasture and from the care of the flock to be commander of my people, Israel. I have been with you wherever you went, and I have destroyed all your enemies before you. And I will make you famous like the great runs of the earth. I will fix a place for my people, Israel. I will plant them so that they may dwell in their place without further disturbance. Neither shall the wicked continue to afflict them as they did of old since the time I first appointed judges over my people, Israel. I will give you rest from all your enemies. The Lord also reveals to you that he will establish a house for you. And when your time comes and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your heir after you from your loins and I will make his kingdom firm. I will be a father to him and he shall be a son to me. Your house and your kingdom shall endure forever before me. Your throne shall stand firm forever. We heard the words that were uh, outstanding in people's minds 
of course, as we read through this for the second time, we also heard the phrases. I think now I would like to ask you, do you have any, anything else to add? Anything else that struck you? Or have you changed your mind about something that you heard previously and now you heard it for the second time? I think the second time um, I heard it more speaking to me as opposed to a story about David. Okay. Are there any other thoughts? I will be a father to him. Make me think of the latest apostolic letter recently that Pope Francis wrote, um, announcing this year to be dedicated to St. Joseph. And one of the chapters in that letter is uh, father, you know, St. Joseph being a beloved father. That, that spoke to me this second time in relation to the disturbance that I heard the first time, how a father brings stability, peace, assurance, and trust. And in my life, I've needed that, and, and I, that's very comforting to me. Any other thoughts? I also agreed with Kristen as far as it being a story of David, it was more um, coming to me, asking me. And I kind of, because you know, the gospels and readings and so forth, there's so much metaphor in almost everyone's writings. And the part where I'm thinking, um, where it says that the Lord also reveals to you that he will establish a house for you. I don't think he's really talking about like people might think a house. Isn't he talking about Jesus Christ, that he's establishing Jesus and that when it's my time, and I'm assuming that means when it's my time to leave the earth, that he will reunite myself and my ancestors with Jesus as the house is being built. Anybody else want to comment on that? My reaction was, is that he's creating a place for us in heaven when our time comes. There's a couple of new phrases that were shared in the uh, chat. Um, okay. I have been with you wherever you went. Uh, he will establish a house for you was something. I think that seems to be uh, hitting a lot of people that, that establishing the house and however the different ways that we're, we're, we're receiving that, that particular uh, theme of this passage. Bert, was Jean going to say something? Um, I don't know. She's okay. You know, um, yeah, okay. I've been behind you. Look. 
let me just leave you with this thought. This house, when David started talking about the house, King David started talking about the house, he started talking in terms of something physical. He wanted to build him something out of cedar, not something out of a cloth material. Like right now he said, wait now, my the Lord lives in a tent and I'm living in a house of cedar. Shouldn't I give him something equally uh, wonderful or even better? But then that's where he stops thinking about what's happening on the physical side. Because then the Lord comes back and starts telling him, I was the one that took you from the pasture. I was the one that did this. I was the one that will make you famous. I will fix a place for my people. All of a sudden, the whole tenor of this conversation is changing from some kind of physical structure to something entirely different that the Lord has in mind. And it's up to us to begin to listen. It's up to King David to begin to listen. What does the Lord have in mind? What kind of house is he talking about? How can I possibly be a father to anything? Anything as great as what the Lord wants. That's Harvey's take. If we want to have any more comments, then we'll continue on with this with the second reading. Any more comments? Okay. Uh, Bert, anything from the chat room? Okay. Well, then, do we have a reader for the second reading, please? Roman. Are we reading the psalm? Are we reading? I, I didn't hear this. Please say it again. Is the song being read, or are we just reading the second reading? No, we're just going to read the second reading. I am not going to read the song. Okay. I think Anne is going to read for us. Okay. Okay. The second reading. Can you, you can hear me, right? right. Okay, thank you. From, uh, from Romans chapter 16, verses 25 to 27. Brothers and sisters, to him who can strengthen you, according to my gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret for long ages, but now manifested through the prophetic writings and according to the command of the eternal God, made known to all nations to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God through Jesus Christ, be glory forever and ever, amen. Thank you. We have all heard the second reading. Is there anything that strikes us from this reading? Revelation. Strengthen Strengthening you. Obedience of faith. From the chat, we have the word command. Um, I think this was said, but the obedience of faith, maybe it was a, a second of that one. And then also made known to all nations. 
revelation manifested. Oh, they're coming in pretty quick now. Uh, proclamation of Jesus Christ, the word glory, a revelation of the mystery. Okay. Anything else? Made known to all nations. Okay. For those of you who uh, have the um, ponder guide you can see that this is the conclusion of paul's letter to the romans he's reinforcing this this concept that there is one who can strengthen you this is this is god this is jesus christ he's begging them in a way please listen Please be obedient. Be obedient to Jesus who is working for his father. He continues to plead. But he shows the strength that we get from our savior, Jesus Christ. And oh, by the way, Paul was not addressing this to the Jewish nation. He was addressing this to the Romans, the Gentiles. They were the great, becoming the, the greatest followers of Jesus. Any other thoughts before we do a second reading on this? Okay, do we have a reader, reader for the second reading? Bert, do we have? Uh, go ahead, B. Brothers and sisters, to him who can strengthen you according to my gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret, long ages but now manifested through the prophetic writings and according to the command of the eternal god made known to all nations to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise god through jesus christ be glory forever and ever amen More thoughts? Anything you can draw from this? Anything that speaks to you? I like the, I'm a person who's an A-type personality. So I kind of like when I'm given a plan and follow the plan and this, tells you there's a plan it's according to this according to that it's going to manifest through here so it's telling you if you listen and follow then you will follow the path that will get you there thank you i also think that he uh, is pointing out that you've been promised a lot over the uh, centuries and now it's actually here
I agree. It's kind of telling you um, in the past, this is what has happened in the past. Um, all the proclamations and the mysteries that have been kept secret for long ago, now that it's manifested, this is what it is. So if you pay attention and you read it, that the one and only true wise God is Jesus Christ. So you've had all this history and foretelling of what was to come and it's here. So he's like giving you background of how it came to be. So if you didn't believe, if you went back to the writings and so forth in the past that were kept long as a secret, well, here it is now. And the, this is kind of like, here's my background and my proof that it's Jesus Christ is the one and only true and wise God. So does anybody see kind of a link set up here between the first reading and the second reading? Let me uh, interject something here. If you look at the first reading, go down to almost the bottom. It says, at the beginning here, it says, uh, and when your time comes and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your heir after you, sprung from your loins, and I will make his kingdom firm. I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. Who do you think he's talking about? This is God speaking. Jesus. He's laying the groundwork, but we have to open our ears and discern what is God really saying. And now... Here's Paul who has already encountered uh, Jesus and what he's he telling the people. He's Jesus. telling them that everything that he's wanted uh, to, that you've been hearing in the past is actually here now. This is the man. There you go. So we have a foretelling, and then we have in the second reading, to me, it looks like it was foretold that someone very special is going to come, and God said he is going to be the father to him, and he shall be a son to me, meaning that he is going to be my son. Now, Paul says, look it. Look what all, all that Jesus has done. He's made it known to all nations to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God through Jesus Christ, through Jesus Christ. Okay, so we have the first reading and the second reading. There is a link. You have to think about it. You have to ponder it. But I want you to do that. Audra, you were going to say something? Well, I was just, I keep thinking as I hear this where God's saying, I did this, I told you this. It's sometimes it's like, I feel like, and not in a negative way, but he's talking to us like, aren't you people listening to me? I told you all of this and you're not being obedient. It's, you know, I think many of us can relate to that with our children. I told you how many times do I have to tell you? And I got that a lot out of these two readings. That it's here. You just have to listen. <laughs> you make me laugh, Audra. You're you're so right. 
it, it, it's it's like he's telling us and he's telling us and he's telling us oh, open your ears i am for real i'm telling you this is what's going to happen i know what's going to happen <laughs> and what do we say yeah, you know, yeah, yeah and that's it i just i see him sitting there sometimes just looking at us shaking his head like oh come on people you can do this so it, it just it did it spoke to me a lot today especially with you know kids and things around christmas and they're wanting so much it, just, it really does that pops out a lot you're absolutely right good point and the other points and that's coming through also in the chat. I saw several times about um, people sharing the word obedient. Uh, uh, Paul is telling me to be obedient to my faith. Um, the manifestation through the prophetic writings and according to the command of the eternal God. Um, and uh, the, the God is the wise, he's wise, he's a wise God. I'm still uh, thinking about Audra's, um, the connection she made about uh, are, are we not listening or, or how many times do we have to hear? And I keep going back to this, uh, that's that last thing that Deacon Elmer shared, the manifestation through prophetic writings, you know, over again, that just constant through the prophets, through the different messages that God has given his people throughout the centuries and continues to uh, even now, um, through different ways, continues to give us the same message. If you, you know, if you just follow my lead, um, I'm going to make everything okay. Everything is going to be okay in the end. It might not be an easy journey, but we're going to get there. And I think even in today's readings um, from Mass was the same kind of theme of this. We're going to get there. Just hang on. Just bear with us let's let we keep on moving so that's that's the thing that i'm getting as well yes my first reaction hearing you bert say that makes me think of a child who's waiting a full year for christmas and it never gets here it never gets here and it's really almost around the corner maybe it's here now Okay, so the first reading sets the stage for us. Something special is going to happen. God is going to some send someone special to us. Paul already encountered in the second reading, Paul already encountered Jesus, and he's trying to reinforce the fact that, look at uh, this mystery has been kept for many ages, but now... Uh, it's here, it's happening. We have Jesus among us. He wants us to obey him. Have faith in him. But so the stage is set for the gospel. And the gospel comes from Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 38. I would like the reader to uh, to begin. However, I'd like the reader to read this uh, paragraph by paragraph slowly so it'll sink in because a lot of folks don't understand what's happening here. And I'll tell you the rest of the story once we get through this. The reader, please. Okay, the angel God, or I'm sorry, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a town of Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man named Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And coming to her, he said, Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at what was said and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. Then the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, 
and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of David, his father. And he will rule over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. But Mary said to the angel, how can this be? Since I have no relations with a man. And the angel said to her in reply, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month for her who was called barren, for nothing will be impossible for God. Mary said, Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. May it be done to me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. Okay, which word struck you or something? What, what struck me and what always surprises me Every time I read it is after this shock and not fully understanding the whole thing. She says, behold, I'm the handmaid of the Lord. It's not, well, wait a minute. What about this? Or have we told everybody? Or what about um, the person I'm engaged to? Or how can this come? No, all she says is, I'm the handmaid of the Lord. After she figures out that that's what's going to be done. Obedience. In the chat, we have the word fulfilled. And again, a, a second on that. Uh, may it be done to me according to your word. And then... Uh, the Lord God will give him the throne of David, his father, and he will rule over the house of Jacob forever. I reacted because she said she was troubled at first. Um, nothing's impossible for God, and he gives the example of her cousin Elizabeth. Oh, nothing is impossible for God, and then he gave, can you say the rest of that, please? He gave the example of her cousin Elizabeth, who's having a child, and she had been barren for many years. Thank you. Sometimes the sound on my machine isn't, uh, isn't very clear. Thank you very much for repeating that. Uh, do we have any other comments? <clears throat> we have um, the two two phrases that are kind of uh, have me. Uh, there's a question in my mind. So it, one one person shared the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and then somebody else shared the follow the, the next following verse. The Most High will overshadow you. Um, I'm just curious, the, the question, I'm, I, I'm, there's a question bouncing around in my head. I haven't quite formulated how to, how to ask it yet, though. But then also, um, Father uh, also shared the, the phrase, David, his father. Well, the David, his father, would be Jesus just because he's coming from the roots of David. Is that correct? Correct. That was the first reading.
Do you see the, uh, I don't know how to do this one. Okay. Do you see how the uh, first reading is connected with the gospel? When it says, I will raise up your hair up after you is sprung from your loins and I will make his kingdom firm. I will be a father to him and he shall be a son to him. And then the gospel says, the Lord God will give him the throne of David, his father, and he will rule over the house of Jacob forever. Jesus. We're, we're dealing with a lot of theology here. But I think we need to just keep it simple. We're dealing with a person in the form of Jesus. We can feel him, touch him, interact with him physically. We know what he looks like. We see his features. We can relate to him because of his, uh, where he was born, the countryside, the people he, he interacted with, the kids he played with. We see him as a person. But then what happens is we also have to believe that this very person is God. And that's where I think everything kind of falls apart. Um, in our way of thinking, because it's we cannot grasp this concept. Here's a man that was foretold to be here for us, with us, and to be our savior, to come and save us, to come and help us, to come and save us. And here he is. But what are our expectations? Someone that we played ball with? Someone that we broke bread with? Someone that we had a glass of wine with? Someone that our family danced with? That's hard to concept, hard to grasp this concept because we're dealing with God. And we always think when we use that word, God, he is so far above us, we can't reach him. We can't touch him. And all of a sudden, we're being told, here he is. The one that you have been waiting for, for centuries, as foretold by the prophet. It's a tough concept. And it's being told in so many words to Mary, this young Jewish girl who is saying, what? Bert, do you have that sketch? I want to show you a sketch. Are you able to see that? No, it's you, you have to blow it up, Bert. It's a, it's a, it's a very small. For the interview, I think. Oh. How about now? There you go. This sketch is by Rembrandt. So for those of you who remember your fine arts course, years ago, in first year of college or wherever you got your fine arts, arts course, you remember the name Rembrandt. Rembrandt sketched this. So a quick explanation, the angel Gabriel, obviously. The girl, Mary. 
But what is the angel Gabriel doing? Catching Mary because she just fell out of her chair. When these words were, were told to her, what do you think her action was? What are you wanting me to do? For my God? This was not an easy message to deliver, let alone to digest, and then to come up with an answer. I wanted to bring that across to you. Rembrandt never painted this, obviously, just a sketch. I thought I would show this to you. This is a, a real sketch. You can go online, you can Google it, and you can buy the sketch if you so desire. 29 bucks or 30 bucks or something like that. I'm not pushing, pushing sketches. <laughs> you can draw your own. <laughs> because some of you have already drawn this conclusion. This is a, a frightening situation for Mary. This is troubling. The problem is that our modern day painters have painted Mary as, oh, everything is calm, everything is serene. Oh, silent night, oh, holy night, all is calm, all is bright, all is wonderful, all is swell. Nonsense. Things were troubling for her. This was no small undertaking. And Rembrandt got it. He really got it. And he's trying to give that picture to us. Just like God is trying to tell us, I think, over and over again, I'm here for you. But here's what's going to take place. Listen. 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 Hey, Bert, you can take that off the screen if you like. And then we could have the second reader. Oops, do we get the uh, words already for this first reading? Yes, we did. Yes. Trouble, uh, obedience, fulfilled. OK. Do we please have a second reader? Yeah, uh, go ahead, Deborah. Okay. The angel Gabriel was sent from God to a town to a town of Galilee of called Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man named Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin name was Mary. And coming to her, he said, Hell, full of grace, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at what was said and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, don't be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of David, his father, and he will rule over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. But Mary said to the angel, how can this be, since I have no relations with the man? And the angel said to her in reply, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is in the next six months of her womb, was called barren, for nothing was impossible for God. Mary said, behold, I am the handmaiden of the Lord. May it be done to me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. For me, the uh, 
the phrase, but she was greatly troubled at what was said has a new um, depth to it now that Deacon shared this, uh, this sketch from Rembrandt. Um, I kind of had the same impression from before that it wasn't just this, but, uh, and I still have the image in front of me and I'm looking at the sketch of her face and she's greatly troubled. <laughs> in the first place, wouldn't it be kind of shocking to see an angel appear to you? Mm -hmm. On the verse, three verses of the gospel, you see the name Joseph. Joseph. Tomorrow's reading of the gospel is about St. Joseph. It's also so troubled. The same as with Mary. Greatly troubled, it said on, the Mary, on Mary. She was greatly troubled. Tomorrow's reading of the gospel St. Joseph is also troubled. He doesn't know what is happening. From the, from the chat, we also have uh, the, uh, that nothing is impossible for God. Um, the angel telling Mary not to be afraid that uh, she has found favor with God. Uh, the, the phrase sent from God, but also the, just the word power. And someone also um, said that Joseph probably fell out of his chair as well. <laughs> and then uh, somebody also, again, shocked, almost fainted recovery. Uh, yeah, so. made some amazing the journey from being troubled to saying behold the handmaid of the lord be done unto me according to thy thy word to me that sounds peaceful our journeys our journey from troubling to peace troubling to peace it's always that's always the direction that we go to in our journeys when we do it with God. In a way, I think too, uh, when they make mention of Elizabeth, you know, bearing a child, it's kind of like foreshadowing, you know, because, you know, John the Baptist came and, and John the Baptist is the one that baptized Jesus. So I think in a way it's trying to tell us there's something coming that he's going to play, he's going to play a special part or role in, in Jesus's life. But I think that really struck me. I never thought about it that way until reading it right now. I have a side thought. I often wonder, what is the last time we hear of Joseph in the Bible? Was it the nativity or was it later than that? He was taking uh, the family to Egypt. He was appeared, uh, an angel appeared to him in a dream uh, to get the, the Holy Family out of uh, is it Nazareth or Bethlehem and get out of there and go to Egypt. Egypt. He was told that. I think that's the last time we hear, hear anything uh, about Joseph, but he is to, to, to lead. Uh, Father, you have, uh, or anybody else can, uh, can, uh, can help me out on this? Well, um, I remember, uh, I'm not sure how old Jesus was, but he was probably, um, seven or eight or when they went looking for him when he was and he said i'm in the house of the lord he was you know mary and joseph were looking for him in the city and they couldn't find him they were all worried and 
he comes out and he says, why are you worried? I was in the house of my father. And yeah, he was 12 years old. Right. Yeah. And Joseph, you know. That's right. So he was 12 years old at that time. Okay. So there you go. Thank you very much. Good, good catch. You know, I always think of, um, you know, it, it shows she was troubled and then she's at peace. But right. think about living in her time period. I don't know how anybody could not be so worried, but back then she would have been stoned to death. And, and for her being so young, I mean, just, just, I can't even imagine trying to take this on. And so her faith, it just, it just, just shows her faith that she knew she was gonna be taken care of. To me is, is, if we really think where she lived and the time frame she was in, I just think that's amazing that she had that faith. I, especially in the culture at the time. You know, if we really think about this very, uh, very thoroughly um, and reluctantly, um, we find that the initial news is shocking. When it comes from God, it's shocking because it's so, uh, I hate to use the word absurd, but in my way of thinking, what is being proposed is absurd. Uh, and, and all of a sudden, as the conversation goes on and as the thought process goes on, the, the angel is there who is a direct messenger and Mary has such firm belief. She, had, she puts herself totally in the hands of God. I am your handmaid. Do with me whatever. I am here for you. You were here for me. I am here for you. Now, to me, the minute you put your hand, you, you put yourself totally in the hands of God, I believe there is a tremendous calmness that happens because you are, you are immersed in God. That's my think. That's my way of thinking o o about this this passage, but this didn't come about easily. Like five minutes, you know, the conversation lasted only five minutes. I'll bet you the conversation lasted oh, for more than five minutes. I can tell you that just to process this whole thing, uh, it's like what to get over the shock is going to be take take me longer than five minutes. <laughs> I noticed that the angel kind of hangs out with Mary until she gives her acceptance and then departs. Doesn't depart until Mary says yes. And so going back to that Rembrandt painting where, or sketch, where the angel's kind of hanging onto her. I think he's hanging onto one arm while she's falling out of her chair. Right. Uh, I think the angel would have to be with me a really long time if uh, it's, it's amazing how I have the benefit of these readings in the story in this group here to say, it's going to happen here. It happens and we can tell it to you. And here's this secret mystery. I'm not Jewish. So I'm one of the Gentiles and, and I'm going to be saved. I'm going to get the best gift ever. And I still doubt. So you angels are going to have to be with me for a while. <laughs> are there I, any other comments? Yeah, I, I agree. I, with the benefits that we have now versus what Mary had, basically nothing. And she was a child. Mm -hmm. You know, she wasn't an adult. She was a child as well. But I mean, I guess with her raising and her upbringing, she was already blessed and found favor with God. And that's the only thing I can think of that 
she was able to listen and get kind of crazy and say absurd, but then she didn't have, I mean, didn't, you know, right, like you said, right away, she didn't have other conversations or nothing. She said, okay, your will be done. So I, I just find that remarkable that, you know, if it wasn't for God and if he wouldn't have already had chosen her, I don't think it would have turned out like that, but God had favor with her and with his love and support, she was like, okay. She took a leap of faith, but I would have still had to be with the angels for a while too. Now, we just hear the conversation between the angel and Mary. I would like to be a fly on the wall and have been there to listen to the conversation between Mary and her mom and dad. <laughs> oh, mom and dad, guess what? Guess what I just agreed to? <laughs> you did what? <laughs> this, this has kind of an interesting ripple effect, doesn't it, when you really think about it? <laughs> so it's, it's something to be really put into our thoughts. Uh, how much trust is put in God, how much trust uh, people have. And then the question is begged right here before us. Do we have the same kind of trust in God? That's a good question for me. Because I can tell you there are times, there are times for Harvey. Any other comments? There was Kendall made a comment. Can you tell me what that was, Bert? Uh, she said that she she wonders if she asked uh, the angel who the Holy Spirit was. Um, we also have uh, Audra had a comment about. Uh, she said that she wonders how the transition occurred, like from going from being troubled and then to being the handmaid of the Lord. And then she goes on and says, she obviously listened and obeyed. And that makes me think of Audra's earlier comment about, you know, from the first and second readings about how many times do I have to tell you? How many times do I have to tell you? So this kind of shows Mary in a light of a good, obedient daughter. Um, and, and not in the sense of like being like a robot where she just does what she's told and, and that's that, but um, I think because of her faith that was given to her by her parents, um, she was listening and she, although troubled at first, uh, ended up obeying. Um, so, yeah. She had to have lots of trust. Because wouldn't you think that she would be concerned about the gossip of a young girl on marriage being pregnant? Well, yeah, somebody else, uh, was it B, you uh, pointed out the fact, the fact that uh, uh, here's this young uh, maiden uh, in those times, uh, even when we were growing up to be uh, found pregnant out of wedlock. Uh, I remember uh, in, my, in my community, uh, look out, you had a hard time getting past the gossip and you weren't very welcome in our community anymore because we know what you did. And even Joseph was going to quietly divorce her. Yep. Yep. Exactly. But thank goodness the angel went to him and told him the same thing, not to worry. Because, you know, it takes an angel to get both of them on the right page. <laughs> but <laughs> I'm, I just think of the conversation that she's having, uh, Mary's having. Does she even pay attention or did it? Did she really grasp the whole concept of what the angel was saying? That he was, she was going to have a son. He is going to be the Messiah. 
he's going to be the son most high, the throne of David, his father. Does she even conceive all of that information besides you're going to have a child, even though you don't have relations with the man and you're a child, you know, did I, I'm just, it just, it's still a mind. I'm just my blows my mind. How this young child has all this information that we read did she really grasp all that concept, the significance of everything that was being said to her besides the physical part that was going to happen to her being unwed and no relations? And then, like you said, a fly on the wall with her parents. But what was the conversation with Joseph? <laughs> you know, he's like, am I marrying a crazy woman or what? <laughs> it speaks to her trust. She probably didn't fully grasp it because she's not a scribe and maybe wasn't so well versed in the Bible, but she, or in the, the tes Testament, but she, um, but she trusted. When, once she probably understood the source, right? She had no more barrier and she was like a, she was a child, she was like a child and said, okay, um, the obedient child doesn't always know the full extent when the parent says something to do something or to follow the parent maybe can't explain or isn't explainable, um, but the child follows the parent. Remember, Mary was, uh, from a very early age, taken and educated uh, in scripture. Uh, she was um, uh, honored in that way. Uh, her mother and dad, uh, mother and father gave her up for that. So she was a, a dedicated a young lady who was very well educated. Now, the, doesn't mean that because she had book smarts that she fully grasped what was happening at the time. Uh, but uh, to me, uh, the realization came eventually to her uh, step by step because this is quite a shock. This is quite a blow, I would imagine. And um, the Lord knows our human condition and how much we can take, uh, but he's asking us, here's what I am proposing. What do you think? He's never telling us, this is what you will do. He's always asking us, will you do this? So you have uh, uh, that kind of background uh, and you have the encouragement from the angel. You see the presence of God, so to speak. Um, and then you have all your upbringing that gives you your hope, your trust, your firm belief. Now, the question is, are you taking all this into heart? And what is your commitment? Mary showed us what her commitment was, regardless of anything else. So, we read subsequently in the Bible that Mary pondered all these things in her heart. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So I don't think I don't I don't think she fully grasped the meaning of the words of the angel. That's for sure my thinking tells me she couldn't at that age. But because she was educated by her parents, tradition has it, and um, that's how important it is no? to be trained and disciplined in prayer. It gives, it helps you to have a better listening heart, even though you don't fully understand what's being told to you. Exactly. Thank you, Father. I think uh, we need to end unless we have another comment. Um, I do want to uh, thank um, Martin and or Sheila, whoever went and, and did some some research for us. The Joseph is only mentioned four times in the Bible, Luke three twenty three and four twenty two, and John one forty five and six forty two. So I'm gonna go and ponder with those for a bit um, to see hear from Joseph or not hear from Joseph, but, um, but I think that was pretty much all the comments that we have for this evening. Thank you.
Thank you for all, everybody that participated. Thank, thank you, you Deacon. Your uh, thoughts? Thank you, Deacon. That, um, uh, the sketch, I love that sketch. I, I think I might buy it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for sharing that. You're very welcome. So let us end. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Dear Lord God Almighty, you have brought us together to listen to your word. You have given us your thoughts, your words, but you have given us not only your promises, but your actions that fulfill them. Help us, Lord, to be open, receptive to your words. We pray for all those tonight who couldn't join us, who are facing trauma in their personal life, who are facing illness, who are facing despair. Lord, I beg you, give them hope, give them help. And above all, Lord, give them your trust. Do we have any other intentions out there or any other uh, uh, items we need to, uh, not items, but requests for prayer. Then again, we thank you, Lord, for this time. And we thank you using the prayer that you have taught us all together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Just a quick Jesus. reminder before we all sign off that um, uh, we'll take a quick, a, a short break uh, on pondering as the next two Thursdays fall on both Christmas and New Year's Eve. So uh, you will have to ponder without us. Uh, so, but then we will resume uh, in the new year uh, during Christmas time. Um, back, we'll continue on Thursdays at six thirty. Um, so we hope everybody has a great and wonderful Christmas and, um, we'll be sending out reminders when we, when we resume our, our pondering together. January 7th. Correct. Father, do you, you look like you have something to say. I, I wanted to raise my hand and I, I still can't see where I can raise my hand. <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah. Wish you all very Merry Christmas. Um, and lots of um, pondering and uh, unity for many people this Christmas is going to be different mm -hmm. and so many have resigned themselves to just being with their spouse or by themselves and and so it's uh, at first sight is is not good but you know let's ponder let's ponder it may it God is a God of su surprises and there may be a lot of good in store for us with these um, circumstances. And I also, I knew I had something else to say. It's a January the 7th when we resume. And um, for Christmas, uh, Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, you know, we have two masses on Christmas Eve at 5.30 and 9.30. Christmas Day, two masses too uh, at... Um, 8.30, correct? 8.30, right. 8.30 in church and uh, 10.15 in Marion. And um, that's correct. I'm not sure what your plans are. If you stay home, we respect that. We all know about the dispensation from the obligation of attending mass by the archbishop. So you are completely in your right to stay home and celebrate Christmas in your heart, in the heart of your home, in the heart of your, your soul, your body. If you, typically speaking, the vigil masses are more crowded, you know, 
before COVID than, you know, than the Christmas day. So if you want to consider attending mass and it's the same for you, you might be better off coming on Christmas day if um, that suits your schedule. Other than that, that's all. God bless you. Good night and Merry Christmas. Thank you. Good night, Good night everyone. Bye-bye.